Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. Today we continue our series on hardy succulents as we learn how to propagate them. I head over to the OSU student farm as the cool season crops are beginning to be harvested and see which warm season crops are beginning to be planted. And finally, we learn how to establish grapevines. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. So if you're looking for an easy, low-maintenance perennial, have two different types of flowers on one plant. Face noise that gives the pepper its heat. Today we are here with Tanner Kyler, who's a junior in the landscape architecture department. And while he enjoys designing landscapes, he also has a fond passion for succulents and cactus. And you are actually helping with the design on the hardy succulent garden yes. we're establishing. But you're responsible for kind of developing some propagation for all of yes, that, right? Yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit about what we have going on here that you're propagating. Okay, so here we have some apuntias. Um, these are native to Oklahoma. And here we have some cilantro apuntias, which means cylinders of apuntia. Good description. Um, yeah, good description, <laughs> yes. And uh, they, they, they grow in similar climates and they, they prefer arid soils or arid environments, uh, meaning they need really well draining areas to survive. And they also are quite cold tolerant. Um, up to negative 20, negative 30. Okay, so we're finding them mainly on western Oklahoma side, yeah, right? Yeah, if you do find any of these species, many of them are native to New Mexico and Texas as well. Okay, all right. So a lot of times we see these in the paths just drop off and propagate. So yes. is it really that simple? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that's how they spread in the wild. If it's not from seeds, they, they genetically clone themselves by dropping off a pad or an arm into the ground and it, it naturally roots okay. and, and a whole new plant will form. So Tanner, where do we get our cuttings in order to propagate? Well, you can get them from a local nursery that sells cold hardy cacti or cacti uh, that you would like to propagate, or you can get permission from a landowner that, um, that and go and collect um, a few of the pads off the plant. This will not harm the plant. It actually can benefit the plant by pruning it back a little bit. Um, but do, do not take the whole, the whole plant or the whole stock from the ground as this can cause damage to the, the, the native species that live there. Right. It can, if it dies, then yes. there's no more to propagate exactly. from. So, okay. So you've got one from the nursery that we're going to yes. propagate here. Tell me a little bit. What, how do we get these off and removed? All right. So right here along the base right here, we're going to just grab one of the pads and we're going to just break, break it, off, it off just like that. Oops. Okay. And then we'll take it and we'll set it down here. But this one here needs to wait 24 to 48 hours to callus over so it does not get a fungal infection here um, where it we place in the soil. Okay, so um, that moisture kind of makes it susceptible to that fungus. Yes, so yes, yes. Like, like potatoes, seed potatoes, mm -hmm. you want to kind of let those heal exactly. over. So these guys have been sitting for a little while, yeah, right? Yeah, two to three months actually. You, cannot, oh. you can see the calluses here and you can see roots actually starting to grow out of these uh, apuntias. Okay. Um, and uh, so yes, they're definitely ready to go in the soil. So when we're potting these up, Tanner, we don't just need regular soil, right? Yeah, what do yeah. we need to use? We need something that can drain well because these um, species are from arid regions where they don't receive a lot of rain and if they receive too much, they will um, come susceptible to root rot. Okay. And so we want to take um, a generic potting mix with um, plenty of perlite and then we're going to mix that with about a two parts uh, soil to one part sand okay. to make a nice good draining mix. Okay, potting soil is what we're talking about, yes. not topsoil, right? Yes. <laughs> so, okay. And then we're going to lay this out flat here. You, can, you only need around a one or two inches of soil just to propagate these things um, because they're not gonna be staying in here very long. And uh, because they're cold hardy, we'll be able to take these and move these out into the soil soon. Okay. Now, outside. So I noticed you have some rooting hormone. Is that necessary? And where do you put the rooting hormone on the cut on the callus? That's end, a good or? question. Yeah, <laughs> with the rooting hormone, it's not 100% necessary, but it does help um, with preventing fungal infections um, near the callus areas and regions of there. And that's where we'll be putting it on. We're okay. going to put it right here where the callus is. All right. So we're going to go ahead and open this up. We'll just pour a little bit in here, and we're just going to take those and we're going to give it a nice little dab in here, around around the base. 
and this will pre prevent uh, fungal growth and it'll help promote root growth. Okay. Um, and of course, you're wearing gloves because yes, even though yes. there's not a lot of spines on that, yes. there are some. There's some little. There's there's hairs. microscopic hairs. Yes, yes and they'll yeah. get all in your hands and they're a big mess. So definitely use gloves with rubber okay. on the inside of them. Okay. Um, and then we'll just take these and we're going to kind of bury the uh, calloused portion um, in the in the base here, and we're going to push this down and kind of just gently push the soil around like this. Okay. So we want to make sure that there's plenty of contact on this pad to promote root growth from the base of it. Okay. Now, normally I think of pads as being something like what you have over here where it's on end sticking in the ground. Yes, it's... and that, there's nothing wrong with that form of propagation, okay. but but uh, if you lay them on their on their backs here, they're going to form these, and this one already has started to grow one of its pads here, mm -hmm. and it'll form pads in a 360 degree um, angle around the pad, uh, around the pad. So okay. it will... Versus here, you're only getting half of yes, the circle. Yes, so um, here it will start, and it'll form its own little bushel here, because in, in nature, they just fall off. There's no one there to plant them. Right, so they okay. just, they fall off, they land on the ground, and if they root, they can, if they can root, they will. Okay, and, and so kind of like the ones that you've got growing here, yes. they almost sort of mimic nature, and that mm -hmm. they've fallen on the ground. Mm -hmm. I know you've planted them, propagated yes. them, but they're, they're kind of curling up, and then, so will they start growing upright then, or? Yes, yes, the actually, they, they're already starting to do that. Okay. So these right here have roots already starting to grow, and we'll go ahead and pull one up to kind of show this. And we have roots right here mm -hmm. that have started to push out, and and once these roots start and the weather is nice outside, you can at any point take them outside. Make sure you have well-draining soil where you put them, and um, they should they should take right off. Okay, so is there a best time to plant these, um, and also when's the best time to propagate these initially? I find that uh, propagating um, in the cooler months is better whenever the plants are done uh, fruiting and they're done uh, flowering, mm -hmm. so you're not to hurt the plant. Um, uh, many of the pads and arms die throughout the winter due to the cold, so it's not going to hurt to take a few of the pads that are most susceptible to the freeze. Okay. And um, well, you take those um, around, I normally take them from like October to like uh, December, um, whenever the weather starts to cool down. and. Uh, so after we've taken this cutting, what do we do with it and how long does it actually take for it to take root? So it, it'll vary species to species, mm -hmm. but these apuntias took about uh, three to four weeks to start um, promoting roots into the ground. And these have been here for around two and a half to three months. So they've had so plenty of time to, to develop some really good roots. Okay, so sort of an ideal winter project for gardeners yeah, if yes. they wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. um, take those cuttings in late fall. Yes. And it, it's low light in your house, so that's okay. Yes, yes, they don't they don't mind um, uh, the, the low light. Actually, if you put them in direct light along the southern facing window, it might be too much for them if they don't have roots. They could end up drying up and dying. Okay. And then they'll be ready to be rooted and everything yes. to go outside. Yeah, so I recommend um, an eastern facing window is the, is the best for propagating cacti. Okay. Is there any concern about our spring rains that we need to be aware of when we're planting a mallow? Yes, yeah. Well, with these species that are native here, there is no issue with them. But if you are trying to plant a drier species that's more native um, to more arid regions of the, mm -hmm. the American Southwest, um, you want to make sure that you have really good, well-draining soil, mostly composed of gravels and sands um, with very little clay. Okay. Um, and this, with, with the clay, if they were to receive too much rain, they will perish due to root rot. Right. Okay. Well, thank you, Tanner, so much for this information. And, yes, no and we look forward to following the project. the new OSU student farm and joining me again is Matt Beartrack. Uh, Matt, so it's been about a month and a half since we've been back here and your cool season crops look phenomenal. Tell me how the season's been going for you. It's been going pretty well. We did have some bug problems as soon as we planted. We had cutworms okay. and just recently in the last few weeks we found um, a cabbage root root fly which you know it lays its eggs down on the roots and uh, it basically killed a few cabbages off okay. at the seedling stage which Initially, we thought it was a fungus, and we sent a bunch of samples off to the lab, and they came back negative, so we started digging more, and we ended up putting out yellow cards just to see what we had, and okay. it turned out it was a, a cabbage root fly. Oh, okay. And so what were kind of the symptoms that flagged you you had a problem on that? 
the cabbages never really got out of the seedling stage mm -hmm. and they just kind of yellowed and then died. And then when we pulled them up, uh, it looked like almost like a dampening off disease okay. uh, where they didn't have any roots growing. Oh. So they were just kind of sitting in the dirt and they just fell over. Okay. All right. Well, everything else seems to be doing well. And the, the yellow cards are sticky. So they basically attract any insects. Yep. Um, so you can see the bad ones, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah, it catches all of them. So it gets good and bad, but uh, you know, and outside it catches thousands of them. But... Right. It's sort of a monitoring device, right, right? Right. So have you sprayed anything else out here? Have you been spraying insects? Because um, I mean, I know we're early for grasshoppers, but uh, cabbage loopers, any of that stuff? Or... We haven't seen any loopers. The only the only uh, lepidoptrin we've seen is um, is the the cutworm. Okay. And we did spray for those at the back in March and we sprayed one time and haven't seen them again. Okay. All right. Well, it looks fabulous. Let's talk a little bit because like I said, it's been about a month and a half. You guys planted, I believe late February. Yep. And since then we've had a few freezing temperatures. Yep. Yep. I mean, cool season crops can handle a light frost, but we're talking freezes. Yep. We planted in late February and then if um, about Spring break, we had uh, some really low temps. I think the mesonet caught a 12, you know, just across the street. So during spring break, uh, we came out here, Linda and I came out and some help from the Botanic Garden people and some other students and spent two days covering these with low tunnels. Okay. So it was, uh, we covered about eight rows. That's all the plastic we had. <laughs> so, and we let, we wanted to leave two just to see how they would take it. Cause your brassicas and, and your lettuces, you know, lettuce not so as tough as brassica. Okay. But your brassicas, you know, they can go down to about 24 and they can actually go lower, but I wouldn't, you know, advise testing and, the waters, you know, that, that much all the time. They were able to handle it uncovered? Or? They did. We have okay. two rows over here in the middle that were uncovered. You can't even hardly tell which ones they are now. Okay. Excellent. Well, hopefully we're out of the freezing temperatures yeah, now. Yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so it's, a, you're already beginning to harvest, correct? That's right. Uh, we started harvesting, um, about April 19th and, uh, we started harvesting lettuce and spinach. We've only done one spinach harvest, just kind of uh, just a trial. And we're, I think we're gonna let it stay in the ground a little longer because we got more cool temps coming. But the lettuce was ready and we've already harvested over about 300 pounds. And they're beautiful heads of romaine lettuce. Romaine lettuce. Yeah. It's a loose leaf romaine, but it's it's doing really well. Okay, and of course that's going to our, our local, our daily yes. bread here, um, food pantry so and, and resource center. So. Yes, all of it goes right to them and uh, they actually took a load just earlier today. Okay, well, and it looks like you're starting on your warm season crops, is that correct? That's correct, we, are, we sure are. All right, well, I'm gonna go catch up with Linda if you don't mind. Sounds good. Thanks. Looks like y'all are starting to plant warm season crops. Tell me what you got going in the ground. Okay. Um, well, it's the end of April, so we're going to start out with getting our warm season crops in. And we've got all this plastic laid. We did this last Friday, and, and here it is on a Monday. And we plan on getting a bunch of warm season crops in. Um, so is everything going in the plastic mulch, or do you have some everything. bare rows? We've got some bare rows. We left. We just did transplanted corn, okay. uh, and, and we're working on that today. Okay. Um, we went ahead and did transplants because we can get things a little sooner in the ground uh, than it's sooner to harvest. So, plus your spacing, we've got this nice transplanter and our spacing is every 12 inches and it makes it nice and even for doing that as well as uh, you don't have to thin your corn. Okay. Um, Versus seed germination, you might have too much or you might have right. some gaps there. In your, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so this is nice and evenly spaced. Okay. Very yeah. good. And so with the plastic culture, I know we've talked in previous segments about plastic mulch, mm -hmm. paper mulch. Let's right. kind of pro con that a little bit. Okay. All right. Well, there's a lot of advantages and disadvantages to pl plastic in general. Um, the paper mulch, we did some trials with that a few years back and it actually worked pretty good. But cost-wise, it's very expensive right now, and maybe in the future that price will come down. Uh, I think it's a very good way to go versus the plastic because okay. it is, you know, biodegradable where right. plastic is not. That's one of the drawbacks: is this it has to be then pulled out, or you've yeah. got it left yeah. behind. Yeah. Um, and the paper did. Correct me if I'm wrong. Did you have to hand lay that, or do you have we a machine? We did. Okay. Um, I'm hoping that maybe maybe by now there's even chances that you can buy it to use with our mulch layer, okay. but uh, 
it's just really expensive right now. Okay. So okay. a lot of commercial people are still using the black plastic for okay. their warm season crops. All right. And this so. is called plasticulture uh -huh. or plastic mulch. It's right. very different mm -hmm. than the hardwood mulch you yeah. might think of. Yeah. Um, but some yeah. of the pros to this. Okay. Let's warm um, it up. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it does. Uh, black, black plastic will warm your ground up where tomatoes, peppers, okra, all those, you need to at least have 60 degrees soil temperature. Okay. Where right now, I looked at the mesonet earlier today and we're at 55 degrees. Right. So we're close, but I think with the black plastic down, it's gonna raise it enough to where the roots will be happy. And when the roots are happy, they're gonna grow and your plants grow faster. You'll ha harvest quicker and earlier. And it just makes sense to Keep it going okay and of course it's got the drip tape underneath that plastic yes. mm -hmm. so it sort of helps you to regulate when we do get rain let's hope we get some mm -hmm. right but it sort of helps regulate those ebbs and flows of rainfall definitely um, versus irrigation yeah yeah so if we were to get a huge heavy rain right now with this plastic being down it, it'll run off of it okay uh, and then like what we're in right now we're in a drought and with our drip tape down it keeps that moisture in it so yes, it, it helps create that equal balance. And of course, that's why we have that trench a little bit to catch that water when it does uh -huh. run off, right? Yeah. So it's not like we're just losing it. Right, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, so let's talk about, you said you've got transplant corn that went in, mm -hmm. transplant tomatoes, what else do you have going in? Uh, transplant okra. Okay. Um, and then we're gonna do a lot of direct seeded stuff as well. Uh, peppers, we also have transplant peppers we'll put in. So all of those we hope to get in this week. And then we'll do some direct seeds on the rest of the plastic mulch with all our cucurbits. Okay, so. well, it's an exciting time. The garden is definitely starting to take off and grow. Yeah. Um, and I know there will come a lot of work with that, with the tomatoes, with trellising them. So we'll yeah. check back with you then. Great, sounds good. Thank you so much. Thanks. here at the Cimarron Valley Research Station and joining me again is Aaron Esri who is our viticulturist and enology specialist. So Aaron, we're planting grapes today. That's right, that's <laughs> and, right. And kind of a little bit different, right? Because we're not doing bare root, we're doing Correct. live green plants already. Yes, these are, um, these are live green potted plants. They haven't quite bud out but it out yet, but they, they will soon. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk more about that, but let, let's talk about first, if somebody is going to start a vineyard or grow a few grapes, what do they need to have in place first yes. before they get the plants? Um, at, at least irrigation. Um, okay. if, you wanna, if you really wanna grow grapes commercially or for wine grape production, a trellis is a good place to start. Um, as you can see, this is kind of the um, halfway built trellis. We okay. have our irrigation is in place. So if you're gonna plant grapes, um, especially multiple at a time, I have your irrigation set because okay. hand watering can be, can be a real pain. Yeah, so we got drip irrigation, but it's on this first um, kind of wire up off the ground. How come it's off the ground? That's for weed control. Okay. So during the summer, um, we'll go through and we'll spray herbicide and then mowing too. Okay. When we, you, you have to mow up and down your rows. And if the irrigation is laying on the ground, you might clip it with a mower. Makes so, sense, okay. Yeah, just, just about a foot off the ground is, is a good height. All right, now this style looks a little bit different than what we saw previously working with you. Yes. Tell me about That's this right. style of trellis. Yeah, so this is a vertical shoot positioning uh, trellis system. Uh, the last time we pruned on a high cordon wire uh -huh. where the vines grow up tall and then grow downward, but this is the cordon wire. Um, the vines are gonna grow to here and then we'll set cordons and everything we're gonna grow vertically. Okay. So we're gonna come back later and run catch wires. We don't have to now, but um, we'll, have, we'll have two sets of catch wires here and that's gonna be just a different training style for your grapevines. All right, so when we're putting in our trellis, what about spacing? Uh, how far between and then also yeah. the planting spacing? Um, it, personal preference. Okay. If you're working with a limited amount of space, like you only have a few acres, you probably wanna come in tighter on your spacing. Here, uh, we have a lot of land and it's a research plot. So we have 12 foot between rows and we have six foot between vines. Okay. 
If you were doing it on your own, you might go as, as tight as nine foot between rows and five feet between vines. Okay. That's, that's pretty common for commercial production. All right, but you want to make sure you have plenty of room between each row so you can get your tractors that's right. and equipment through there. That's right. Yeah. A, a wise thing would be to measure your tractor and then go about an extra foot. Okay, excellent. So let's go ahead and talk about what we got here and, and planting wise. Sure, if you sure, want to show sure, us sure, how sure, the sure. process. Um, um, thank you. Yeah, so these are green potted uh, vines. Now they're supposed to be green They've been in cold storage, so uh, they haven't quite budded out yet, but there is live buds here that, okay. that will soon. But as you can see, the roots are already out. So okay. these are, it's just like any other, you know, plant you pick up at a nursery or, or, or whatnot, but this is what they uh, this is what they look like. This is a, a, a potted grapevine. Okay, and what grapevine. kind is this vine? This is Picpoul Blanc. Okay. This is from South France, and it's, um, we're just gonna see how it does here in Oklahoma. All right, so, so is this grafted too or? Yes, okay. these are grafted. This is a complete uh, different rootstock and a complete different scion grafting them together. You take an American rootstock, which is usually better for diseases and, and the natural soil here in America. So you use an American rootstock, but the uh, European scions are usually better for wine production. Okay. So that's, uh, you just graft them and this is what you end up with. And now will we plant this as it's normal, uh, you know, go ahead and let's plant oh, it sure, up, sure, I guess. Oh, sure, 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 sure. So I've already dug the hole. Okay. It's just um, about six, seven inches deep, four inches wide. A, a post hole digger works really well. But then just like you plant anything else, you just kind of have to dig it out a little. And again, I have the irrigation going right. that, that softened the ground a lot. I'm just going to kind of wet this under the drip. You know, if you sometimes your, your irrigation, your holes won't light up exactly under a drip emitter, right. but, but that's OK. Uh, as long as as long as they're wet going into the ground and then the water will reach them. Um, but you just kind of you put it in the ground here. So you're planting it a little deeper than what it was originally planted. Yeah, just a, just a little. I mean, you, it's 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 good to do that. You just don't want to bury this graft union. Okay. You don't want to bury the graft union. Uh, with time, the vine's going to grow. It's going to push itself out of the ground just a little bit. So I bury it up to here. Okay. And and that's okay. That's right. okay. So you just backfill with the native soil that you. Correct. Yeah. This is the soil I just pulled out of the ground. Just backfill it in. You know, make sure your vine is sturdy, it's straight. You never want to plant under the row. You want to plant just to the side of it. Okay. But just a little. You don't want to go too far out. Right, see, but right. Just, and just... I've noticed you've planted them all on the same side. Is that just oh, an aesthetic thing? Oh, no, okay. that's good observation. Everything on a trellis is done on, on one side. Okay. The irrigation's on the right side. The wires are on the right side. The vines are on the right side. Um, it just makes things easier. Okay. So, yeah, always work on one side of your trellis. All right. Yeah, and so you just fill this in, kind of break this dirt up as best you can. And uh, so yeah, and so that's that's planting. Give it, you know, a little tug just to make sure it's it's there. And then you just fill it in, and then run some water. It'll it'll reach it. Yeah, it'll, yeah. It'll reach okay. it, and then. So what about fertilizing? Is this vertigation that we're running here, or no? This is just do we need to fertilize water. Not for now. Um, if you want to amend your soil prior to planting, that's okay. You just run a soil test, and if you're low on nitrogen or potassium or phosphorus, anything, just incorporate it in. No need to plant or no need to fertilize at planting. We okay. this won't receive any fertilizer this year. Oh really? Okay. Next year, if we want to, if if, if they're showing symptoms for you know a deficiency, we we can. Uh, but not not for this year. They'll, right. they'll be all right. So what are we expecting when we see growth coming? Where do I start tying it up? Yeah. I mean, is it going to reach all the way up here this first time? Possibly. Um, and that's now we're getting into vine training. Okay. We just planted it. Right. If it grows and it hits this wire this year, we'll snip it. And by snipping it, that causes it to push lateral growth okay. because you take away apical dominance and you, you push lateral. Right. So, so that's going to be our cordons that we're creating. That's it. That's it. Okay. That's it. If, it. if it hits, the, if it gets to the wire this year, you snip it, it pushes lateral growth. Those are your cordons. Okay. And then from there, you know, the next year it develops spurs and canes. If it doesn't reach this wire this year, let's say it grows and it only gets to about right here. Right. We'll let it go dormant and then come pruning time, we'll cut it off right here again where, and just start all over. Okay. And, but it'll, it'll be ready. It'll be more, you know, all those carbohydrates are right. developed and it's, it's ready to so go. So it'll through. really take off, it'll, definitely reach it, this wire. That's right. Then by next year, it will for sure reach the wire and okay. then you start training. Okay. So that way we just have one year's growth that is that kind of trunk, I guess, of the, yeah. of the grapevine. Um, so these buds, I mean, they'll, when they, when they, when they 
start growing, you might have two or even three. Uh -huh. you, you just let it grow for now, mm -hmm. but then with time, you'll start to see which one is dominant. Okay. And then you keep that one. You okay. cut the rest and then that becomes your trunk. Okay. And you know, it's a little one-year-old trunk and then I guess a little, little baby grapevine. So, Aaron, I noticed there's some paper kind of, uh, or plastic covers on the ones behind us. Tell us what those are. That's right, those are plant protectors. Okay. And ha being a young baby grapevine, those plant protectors help with the elements, including this wind. <laughs> we got you a see. little wind here in yeah. Oklahoma. And so uh, once we plant, we put a little plant protector on there and we'll keep it on all year, take it off September, October. Okay. Uh, we take it off then because it'll still, the vine itself will start to harden up for the winter. Okay. You know, so, um, but yeah, just for this first year, they, they help protect against the elements. Okay. All right. Well, we'll continue to follow this process and thank you for sharing. Oh, this of with course. Us. Thank you, Casey. There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. Join us next week right here on Oklahoma Gardening as I give you a reason not to mow your lawn. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. Join in on Facebook and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticulture Society, the Tulsa Garden Club, and the Tulsa Garden Center. <laughs>